okay this is the urine learning system for <coughs> the pre med students 211 uh, for this spring semester 2020 okay, this is the learning objective by the end of the lecture students should be able to to list the components of the urinary system discuss the covering of the kidney describe the anatomical anatomy of the kidney in terms of location shape relations hilum blood supply plus student will be able to discuss the nephron in terms of its parts and their location and anatomy of the ureter in terms of extension constriction blood supply and then urinary bladder with its location shape blood supply and some brief comparison between male and female uh, urethra now this is the slide showing components of the urinary system the urinary system comprises of two kidneys two ureters definitely right and left side urinary one urinary bladder uh, one urethra so in the next slide this is something about the physiological aspect means the functions of the urinary uh, organs or the urinary system uh, filtration to remove toxins and metabolite metabolic waste from the body definitely the urinary system ultimately it forms the urine that is the waste it should not be collected inside body similarly excretion of nitrogenous waste nitrogenous waste is the most dangerous for the nervous system that causes sometimes uh, there is a <coughs> in liver diseases and liver cirrhosis uh, and calf it's called as the hepato and calf uh, in which the nitrogenous waste material elements that fail to be excreted through the urinary system it increases in the blood and goes to the brain and make a comma again so uric acid again uric stones and uric acid pain in the joints creatinine again there is the standard for the function of the uh, kidney if it is raised kidney is, is disturbed then the regulation of the blood volume and the blood pressure definitely when the urine is formed this means more of the water is out of the body so pressure of the blood body is uh, of the blood is decreased so blood pressure and the volume both should be decreased in emergency cases for the high blood pressure patient if came to your clinic or come to your clinic so first line of treatment is that you have to give and uh, diuretics so diuretic will uh, make more water and more volume of the uh, plasma blood and water is expelled out of the body so pressure will be reduced the regulation of ph acid base balance of extracellular fluid acid base hydrogen ions bicarbonate ions they are also regulated by the kidney filtration mechanism so that is also controlled by this renal system rbc synthesis hematopoietin secreted by the kidney it regulates the synthesis vitamin d synthesis vitamin synthesis here it does not mean the urinary system synthesize vitamin d no it is present below the skin in the lipids the superficial fascia that contains the fats so it's a cholesterol derivative vitamin so over there under the sunlight it goes in the inactive form so two hydro uh, hydroxylation is required one is in the liver second in the kidney then it become activated vitamin D that is utilized uh, by the body for the absorption of calcium then ureter act as a conduit conduit means a tube like structure for the passage of urine from the kidney because kidney form the urine and that urine should be uh, expelled out so to take out from the kidney and store in the urinary bladder this ureter is used urinary bladder st storage where temporarily it is used when it is full uh, you uh, it, it start maturation reflex due to the stretch of the wall of the bladder urethra is the final tube from the urinary bladder the tube that gets out of the body okay this is the slide that is more uh, anatomical oriented so here we can see first of all the position the location of the uh, kidney it is a retroperitoneal the retroperitoneal means behind the peritoneum now this is the front view of the abdomen and if you cut the 
abdomen transversely at the level of the kidney not below the kidney not above the kidney at the level of the kidney and then you see from the superior view it will appear like this so this is the empty cavity here and this is bounded by the parietal peritoneum because visceral peritoneum all the viscera are removed so only the parietal peritoneum that is along with, with the wall there is the anterior side so there is the vertebra there is the posterior side so we have got there is the lateral wall so anterior lateral and there is the posterior parietal peritoneum covering the posterior wall of the abdomen now this is the peritoneal cavity and you can see this brown color structure there is a cut section of the kidney and showing the renal artery and veins there is the aorta and this is the cut section of the inferior vena cava right so there is the inferior vena cava there is the aorta and there is the vertebra so kidney is retroperitoneal uh, which lies obliquely in the superior lumbar region now these are very important where it is located superior lumbar region uh, so on the posterior abdominal wall then the second point is the right kidney slightly lower than the left kidney now this is the right side this is the left side right kidney left kidney you can see this right kidney is slightly lower than the left kidney why because above the right Uh, kidney we have got a very long very large rather the largest gland of the body the liver liver is the largest gland is here so it due to that one and liver is a solid structure comparing to the stomach that is on the left side that is hollow from inside this liver is a solid structure that's why it cannot compress that one so it 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 goes down the right kidney is slightly lower then we have got the right kidney may be palpated in thin individual at the end of deep inspiration when you inspire what happens the abdominal muscles become relaxed and deep inspiration your abdomen is very relaxed and then in that relaxed abdomen you can uh, push your hand deep in your abdomen so at that moment you can find the right kidney more because on the left side it is more covered up by so many by small intestine and other parts then we have got the level of the kidneys alter with respiration and posture so when you are standing up so this kidney since it is not fixed by ligaments or all other things so these organs are slightly movable in the next slide we have got the relation of the kidney now this is sometimes very important for very good students to get good marks now relation means what is your relationship with your surrounding so what is the relation of the kidney with its surrounding structures right so right kidney first and then the left kidney now find the where is the right kidney this is the right kidney with the adrenal gland at the top yellow colored pyramidal shape and concentric shape adrenal gland on the left side there is the kidney and there is a membrane that is the peritoneum right and at so membrane is here and here you will see that there is no peritoneum right and this diaphragm which muscle is this the diaphragm is exposed so the structure that is here that is removed is actually the liver and previously we have discussed the liver on the superior surface has got a bare area means bare area without the covering of the peritoneum so this diaphragm is directly in contact with the bare area without uh, peritoneal covering on the superior surface of the liver is direct contact with the diaphragm inner surface now this is the area that is covered by the parietal peritoneum now here again you can see that there is no peritoneum why because this area is the area for the ascending colon corresponding to this area that is the area that is for the descending colon right so ascending and descending colon are also retroperitoneal means behind the peritoneum so when the only the anterior surface is covered by the peritoneum the posterior surface is not covered so when you remove the ascending and descending colon you actually remove the uh, the anterior surface peritoneum so peritoneum here is missing now come to the kidney kidney here right kidney what structures are anterior to this right kidney can you see this adrenal gland yes yes can you see this which part is this this is the c shape Curve, the first part of the small intestine, the duodenum, and there is the cut part of the stomach. The stomach is removed, right? So stomach will come here, right? Anterior to the uh, left-sided kidney. Now, adrenal gland, 
right suprarenal gland second part of the duodenum means only so duodenum has got first second third and fourth part right so third fourth is here first is here so second part part is mostly lying to anterior to the right kidney then right colic flexure colic flexure colon so bending in the colon so this ascending colon bends and become the transverse colon so this bending here this called as the uh, colic flexion and sometimes hepatic side the two bending one bending is here on the right side the other bending is on the left side so right bending is below the liver so sometimes it's called hepatic flexure hepatic colic flexure and his, this one is below the spleen here stomach then spleen so this bending uh, from transverse to descending that is called as a splenic flexure of the colon so there is the right colic flexure right colic flexure left colic flexure hepatic flexure splenic flexure all are same now left kidney left suprarenal gland can you find this is the left kidney here right now what is anterior to this one this left suprarenal gland and what is this this is the tail and the start of the body of the pancreas right pancreas the head of the pancreas in the center of the c shaped curvature of the duodenum so what left suprarenal gland spleen because this tail attach is connect is touching the spleen here spleen is also removed spleen is also intraperitoneal right so intraperitoneal not extra so spleen is re removed but this tail so spleen is anterior then stomach stomach very big part this cut part of the stomach this is the pyloric part right cut down so stomach is here with esophageal opening this one so stomach big portion this is anterior then pancreas yes tail of the pancreas and the body of the pancreas. left colic flexure this descending colon and then the bending is all transverse colon transverse colon is intraperitoneal totally intraperitoneal with transverse mesocolon while the ascending and descending they are retroperitoneal left colic flexure then coils of jejunum now this is the part where is the left colic flexure is here now this part is only left that is actually the lower part that is in contact with the small intestinal relationship come to the posterior relation posterior relation of the kidneys so in the posterior relation what you will see this is the posterior view from the back so from the back side if you are seeing this one so this is the left side and this is the right side so right kidney is this one left kidney is this one now first thing in the posterior relation is the diaphragm okay come here in this figure this is the kidney right if you see which structure is this which muscle is this this is the diaphragm diaphragm go down up to the lower half of the posterior side on both the kidneys right so one relation is the kidney so this green color area this green color posterior side because this is the posterior view so posterior view between the ribs and the kidney which green color structure is here is covered by this green color is indicating the area of the diaphragm that is between the kidney and the ribs right kidney and the ribs right then we have costo diaphragmatic rasis of the pleura so above the diaphragm we have got the lungs and the lung lower part is at 10 t10 but the parietal pleura goes to t12 so this is the t11 t12 so up till here the parietal pleura is there right so after this after the diaphragm above the diaphragm uh, we will find the parietal double layer of parietal peritoneum parietal pleura not peritoneum parietal pleura because uh, uh, you are above the diaphragm so here you will see diaphragm then after the above the diaphragm you will find the double layer of parietal pleura right that is the costo diaphragmatic rasis right then we have got the muscles for the muscles they have colored three three colors are here right both the medial side to memorize which structure on the posterior relation it is very easy so sometimes the upper half of the right kidney upper half of the left kidney right kidney upper half of the left kidney they are occupied by the diaphragm right 
The lower part, you can see here, the muscles are visible, right? So there are three muscles for both right and left kidney. The medial, medial muscle is the sauce major muscle. Middle muscle is quadratus lumborum muscle. And the lateral muscle is transversus abdominis muscle, right? So we have got sauce major, quadratus lumborum, and transversus abdominis. These are the three muscles in the lower half of both the kidney on the posterior relation of both the kidneys. So anterior relation, right kidney, left kidney is different. But the posterior relation of both the kidneys are same. The third posterior relation is related to the nerves. So nerves are not shown here, but you have to memorize which nerves, subcostal nerve, iliohypogastric nerve, ilioinguinal nerve, running downward and laterally. So these three nerves you have to memorize, right? The picture is not here. Then another 12th rib for the right. The only difference, yes, this is the exception of the posterior relation. Everything is same on both the kidney, except the last point. That, what is that? You know the right kidney is slightly lower than the left kidney, right? Here, there is the right kidney slightly lower than the left kidney. So since it is lower, so it is just touching the 12th rib, right? While the left side, which has got a higher, so it is also touching the 11. So for the right kidney, posterior relation, only 12th rib is there. And left kidney, posterior relation, 11th and 12th, both are there. Now, this is the slide showing the renal coverings. What structures are covering the kidney? First of all, fibrous capsule closely applied to the kidney. If this is the kidney, the kidney is actually inside. But on the surface, just like the visceral peritoneum, visceral pleura, visceral pericardium, there is a facial, it is not a membranous, serous membrane, but it's a covering. So that covering is a fibrous covering called as a fibrous capsule. Capsule, anything that is contained, containing something. So kidney is all covered up, contained within a fibrous capsule. So this capsule is called as a fibrous capsule. Sometimes it is also called as a true capsule because there are some other perirenal, perinephric fat. Now, this is a cut section, again, transfer section of the kidney of the abdomen at the level of the kidney and you can see this kidney and kidney is covered up by this fibrous layer right fibrous layer uh, is not shown uh, with different color but outside the fibrous layer you can see this yellow color fatty deposition a thin layer of fat is surrounding the kidney this thin layer of fat is called perinephric fat so perinephric fat or perirenal fat peri means surrounding so surrounding the kidney then so, <clears throat> then renal fascia, fibrous capsule is again a fascia, then fat, then fascia, then fat. So, fascia is here, renal or garrotas fascia. So, garrotas fascia, can you see this after this perinephric or perirenal fat, this is the fascia that is covering. So, where my pointer is running, this is the garrotas fascia or that is called the peri. Uh, uh, renal fascia this is called the renal fascia so renal fascia and the fibrous capsule renal cap fascia uh, what comes in mind the fascia around the kidney right but this is actually a false capsule false fascia the true fascia is just this fibrous cap fascia fibrous capsule that is running on the surface of the kidney right so that is attached with the kidney this fascia is not attached with the kidney it is actually covering the perinephric fat right so that's why this garrotas fascia or renal fascia is also called as the false capsule of the kidney false fascia right anchors the kidney to the abdomen so they are actually covering the kidney and then this fascia is attached with the fascia of the muscles so it is also attached with the wall of the abdomen then we have got para Para means beside. Beside the kidney, there is a fat. So we have kidney, then we have got the fibrous capsule, the true capsule, then perinephric fat, then garrotas fascia or renal fascia, the false fascia, 
and then outside the fascia you can see this is any yellow color this is another fat pad pad of fat right so this is beside the kidney so this is only on one side right here and here not all surrounding so this fascia is called as the paranephric fat so paranephric para means beside it is not surrounding the kidney it is not peri it is para so external to the renal fascia holds the kidney in opposition to the posterior abdominal wall now this is the kidney external feature of the kidney external feature of the kidney what is the length of the kidney length height length and breadth height of the kidney 12 cm Le length into breadth 6 so breadth is 6 cm length into breadth into height it means so from right to left transversely it is 3 cm thick weight of the kidney it is 130 grams shape of the kidney being shaped surfaces of the kidney anterior surface and posterior surface surface means the flat surface right so borders if you see this is the surface anterior surface where the anterior and posterior surface will join they will form the borders so how many borders are there again okay uh, so for the borders you can see this is the anterior surface lateral margin or lateral border right and this must be the medial border because this is the medial side lateral side so lateral border medial border right so medial border is this and this is the lateral border what is this upper and lower extreme these are called as the poles upper pole lower pole upper pole is occupied by the position of the suprarenal gland right and lower pole is free so borders lateral medial border poles superior and inferior poles hilum of the kidney hilum we have discussed is the surface of the solid organs where all the structures are going in or getting out right so in the kidney nowhere else except this area the structure are going in and out so this surface of the kidney that where the medial border is there so this medial border area this is the hilum of the kidney right so this area is the hilum of the kidney just like here this circle this is showing the hilum of the kidney right so here this entrance is the hilum of the kidney this entrance the hilum of the kidney so it is the area medial border where structures enter and leave the kidney then a renal sinus now renal sinus means cavity this circle is showing the entrance right and here the surface of the kidney this is the hilum right but this surface is not a straight surface it is a curved surface right so the cavity that is present within this cur curved surface that cavity is called the sinus so this is the renal sinus that contains the structure right while the hilum is along the medial border medial border so this is the hilum of the kidney and this is the, is the uh, renal sinus so renal sinus and then renal hilum right so sometimes so so on the surface we have got the hilum and the cavity is called the sinus renal sinus then we have got the internal feature of the kidney internal features of the kidney cortex of the kidney now cortex when you cut any any organ in the transverse section only you can see the central portion and the peripheral portion central area and the peripheral area in the cut section of any organ so this is a cut section of the kidney this is the cut section of the kidney the most peripheral portion that is light in color this is the cortex and the central this dark area this is the start of the medulla right so this is the medullary area containing this triangular pyramids right so pyramids are present in the medullary region so this is the medullary region right cortical region right the area so cortex the outer peripheral zone that extends into the medulla between the adjacent pyramids as the renal columns now here you can see that these pyramids they are separated by the extension part of the cortex right 
so this is the cortex peripheral part and the part that is extending between the pyramids while the pyramids these are the medullary structure so medulla is here but between the medullary inside the medulla there are cortical a portion that is going into the medullary region right between the pyramids so between the pyramids this cortical region this is called as the renal columns so this is the renal column this is the renal column so what are renal columns these are the cortical extension inside the medullary region between the pyramids then extending from the base of the pyramid into the cortex are striations called medullary rays now this is the figure medullary rays rays are straight structures right so can you see straight lines in the pyramid these straight lines straight lines straight lines straight lines straight lines right so these straight lines these are called as the medullary rays so this is the big picture showing this the pyramid and this is the cortex above the pyramid so these vertical lines they are called as the medullary rays but histologically what actually these straight lines these straight lines are the part of the nephron which what are the what what part of the nephron are very very straight so only two parts this one straight part that is called the collecting duct and this two straight part that is called the loop of henle loop of henle descending loop of henle and ascending loop of henle right so these two loops ascending and descending they are very straight so straight things form the straight lines and these straight lines they are called as the medullary rays right medulla medulla is the innermost part of the kidney where the renal pyramids are so from this line downward right this is the medullary area and what is present in the medullary area pyramids and what is present between the pyramids cortical extension that are called as the renal columns right so medulla has got the pyramids the base which are towards the cortex now this is the pyramid triangular shape these are the pyramid triangular shape pyramids they are triangle triangle and every triangle has got three apices and three bases right the lines are called bases so this is the apex and opposite to the apex lies the basic line so this line is the base of the pyramid for this apex so apex they are entering into entering into the minor calyx right can you see this apex entering into minor calyx apex this is the base of the pyramid this is the apex of the pyramid like all triangles have got the apex and the base base is the line opposite to the apex so these are called as the pyramid so all the apices apices plural apex 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 they are entering into which structure they are all entering to the minor calyx now this is another structure internal features internal feature of the kidney renal pelvis is an expanded funnel shaped superior part of a ureter so where is the ureter this is the ureter right superior part of the ureter now extend the ureter upward this is continuous with this structure so this structure is actually the renal pelvis that is distended funnel shape expanded funnel shape superior part of the ureter in the renal sinus so renal sinus was what the space renal hilum was the kidney part the medial border right and within the medial border inside there was a cavity so that cavity was the renal sinus so this is the renal sinus where you can find the pelvis and its division so inside so it divides into two to three short tubes the major calyx now ureter this is the this central part not divided part the big expanded part this is the renal pelvis but this pelvis later on to enter into the kidney it divides into major calyx first to broad part 1 2 3 
so these three they are called the major calyx right but each major calyx then further divide into minor calyx right so these one two three are the three divisions of one major calyx right so, and these minor calyxes they are receiving the epiphysis of the pyramid each major calyx divides again into 7 to 14 minor calyxes then each minor calyx receive the opening of the collecting tubes on the papilla of the pyramid that projects into the minor calyx where is the papilla <coughs> papilla is the apex apex of the pyramid and this is the base of the pyramid right base of the pyramid apex of the pyramid the apex is also called as papilla papilla is any elevated structure any speed breaker from the surface something is elevated up so this is called the papilla so here this is a cut section showing one pyramid so this pyramid this is the base of the pyramid that is towards the cortex the base of the pyramid that is facing the cortex right so all the bases of the pyramid they faces the cortex and the apex that is the papilla so papilla is pointed projection this projection is actually projecting into the minor calyx these are the minor calyxes so within the minor calyx you will find this elevation right so this elevation in medical terminology it is called papilla so this papilla is actually penetrating into the or opening into the minor calyx right so this is one pyramid base of the pyramid toward the cortex and the papilla or apex is opening to the minor calyx right now if you enlarge this with this what is this yellow color tube collecting the and what is this loop loop of Henlein they are very straight forming the medullary rays right now enlarge this picture this is the one pyramid right showing this is the base of the pyramid here and this is the apex of the pyramid or papilla so renal papilla is this can you see so many openings here because these are all openings of the collecting duct each one is the opening of one collecting duct and one collecting duct is a part of uh, actually this is the duct of Bellini and uh, these are collecting ducts right so collecting duct here all the collecting duct of the nephron so this duct of Bellini and the collecting ducts right this collecting duct opening into the duct of Bellini right so this is very straight similarly loop of Henley descending and ascending loop of Henley so they are very straight so they form the medullary rays so each minor calyx minor calyx is shown here minor calyx is this one this one this is minor calyx this is minor calyx that is face or receiving the apex or papilla of the pyramid right receive the opening of the collecting tubules so in the papilla what is going on in the papilla there are so many openings of this straight tube that is connected with the collecting duct right of the nephron so this collecting duct so many 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 all nephrons they through their collecting duct they are ultimately opening into this duct very long duct there is one duct and there are several openings so every opening is opening into this papilla so this papilla is fenestrated fenestrated means several openings are there why these openings because this nephron form the urine and urine passes through the nephron descending loop ascending loop collecting duct and ultimately to the duct of Bellini so many collecting ducts are opening to the duct of Bellini so so many urine are coming into the duct of Bellini and ultimately this duct of Bellini opens on the surface of the papilla but papilla is opening into the minor calyx right so all the papillary uh, urine this urine that is forming here they will go through the papilla into the minor calyx and minor calyx to the major calyx to the major calyx to the pelvis and then to the ureter now come to the nephron what is a nephron is the structural function unit of the kidney one million nephrons are there each nephron consists of the following parts renal corpuscles where is renal corpuscle a renal corpuscle consists of glomerulus which is a tough of capillaries 
embedded in the Bowman's capsule. This green color capsule, capsule means something covering, right? So it is covering a capillary network. So artery is coming here, afferent arteriole and there is the efferent arteriole, right? Any one of them. So this is a capillary network bounded by the Bowman's capsule. Bowman's or the scientist capsule means covering. So these two capillary and the bone capsule, capsule and the capillary, they are called as the renal corpuscles. So renal corpuscle is not one structure, it is a two structure, the combination of two structure, the capillaries and the Bowman's capsule. So capsule is a part of the nephron. So nephron starts with this capsule that was discovered by Bowman's. So it's called the Bowman's capsule, right? Surrounding this capillary network in the center. The Bowman's capsule is the proximal cup shape part of the renal tissue. So it is cup shape and inside the cup the capillary capillary network is there, right? So this is the first part of the nephron. Nephron is this green color, blue color, purple color, yellow color, right? Then we have got the urine, uriniferous tubules consist of proximal tubule, intermediate, distal, collective. This is a convolution, right? Coiling, proximal coiling, and this is a distal coiling, right? So proximal convoluted tubule, then this is the distal convoluted tubule, and between proximal and distal, they are connected by this loop. This is called the loop. Henle was the discoverer, so it is called loop of Henle, right? So these are the parts of the nephron. Bowman's capsule as the first part, proximal convoluted tubule. Then loop of Henle with descending and ascending parts, distal convoluted tubule, then the collecting duct, right? With so many collecting ducts, and ultimately, this is the duct of Bellini. Bellini was the scientist who discovered this. Now, come to the blood supply. Blood supply 20 to 25 percent of the cardiac output is given to the each kidney in each heartbeat. Renal arteries, right and left renal artery arise from aorta at the level of L2. So aorta give a branch at the vertebral level. Which vertebral level? Second lumbar vertebra. Renal artery that goes right and left side. It is paired. Each renal artery divided into five segmental arteries as it enters the hilum of the kidney. So this kidney, this let's suppose is the renal artery of the left side, left renal artery entering here. As it enters, kidney, just like the lungs, it is divided into lobes, right? So here the kidney, it is divided into segments, right? So there is no lobes, big structure. They go directly go into the segmental division. So how many segments are there in each kidney? Five segments. So th this renal artery of each side, it will give five branches. And those are called as the segmental branches, right? So it gives five to six segmental branches that will go to the five or six segment segments of the kidney. Then in each segment, the segmental artery will divide into interlobar arteries. So interlobar arteries, they will go, these segmental arteries, when they go inside one segment, then they divide and run between the pyramids. In the region that is called the renal column. So in the renal column, the segmental artery actually it divides, and the divided artery that is called the interlobar artery, they runs in the renal column, right? And this artery is called as the interlobar artery. So interlobar artery, this is the pyramid, this is the cortex. So between the pyramids, so this is the interlobar artery comes here between the pyramids. Which artery is running between the pyramids or which artery is running in the renal column? It is the interlobar artery, right? Then after interlobar artery, when it reaches at the base of the pyramids, right? What happens? Each interlobar artery divides into two arcuate artery. So this arcuate artery, two branches. One goes to the right, the other one go to the right, the other one get to the left. Here again, interlobar artery, two branches, one go in right side, the other one go on the left side. And this right side and left side, they enostomos, form an arch, arch at the base of the pyramid. 
So this arch is called as the arcuate. Arcuate is derived from the arch. So arcuate artery is derived from the arch. So arch is where the arcuate artery is running along the base of the pyramid. So which artery is running along the base of the pyramid? Arcuate artery, right? So segmental artery divides into interlobar artery, interlobar artery divides into arcuate arteries and then arcuate arteries then give off the interlobular, lobular. So this arcuate artery gives straight arteries. These straight arteries, since it was interlobar, so it is more smaller, so it is interlobular. Interlobar and it is interlobular lobe lobule so this is interlobe and it is interlobule so interlobular artery then interlobular arteries then divides and give can you see this branches these are the straight now here you can see this these interlobular arteries they give the afferent glomerular artery afferent glomerular artery are were what they were entering to the glomerulus. Now here, the venous drainage. Come to this chart. This is important. From the aorta at the level of L2, give the renal artery. Renal artery enters into the kidney, become the five segmental artery. Segmental artery then runs between the pyramids called as, okay. Uh, segmental artery enter into one segment or lobe it is called lobar artery between the lobes between the pyramids interlobar arteries then at the base the two branches from right and left, left side of the pyramid an arch is formed called as the arcuate artery from the arch arises a straight artery called interlobular artery from the interlobular artery arises the afferent arteriole from the afferent arteriole it forms the glomerular capillaries that is inside the Bowman's capsule. So inside the Bowman's capsule, the capillaries it is the arterial capillary, right? So the artery that is entering and dividing into capillary, that entering one is afferent. And the other end of the capillary, the another arterial efferent artery, arteriole forms that is called the efferent arteriole. So both are arteriole. This is not a capillary between the artery and the veins between capillary and also it, it is the capillaries between the artery and the artery. So efferent arteriole comes out of the glomerulus, it becomes same interlobular, so peritubular cap capillary and vasa recta, okay, it is also receiving from here. Then same interlobular artery, interlobular vein, arcuate artery, arcuate vein, interlobular artery, interlobular vein, and then lobe, this is extra here. So then renal vein and the renal vein ultimately drain into the inferior vena cava. Now come to the, these are the vein. Renal vein emerge from the hilum in form of the renal arteries and drain to the inferior vena cava. Lymphatic drainage, lymph drainage to the lateral aortic lymph nodes around the renal artery origin. So where the renal artery originates, right? This is the lateral aortic lymph nodes. This all green lumbar aortic nodes is written here. Leave every other nodes, right? Only concentrate on the green. So this green is actually lateral aortic lymph nodes. So this aorta is here, lateral side. So lateral aortic lymph nodes. Then come to the renal pain. Renal pain, clinically, how you where you observe the renal pain can result from stretching of the renal capsule or renal capsule was what? The true capsule. When the kidney is inflamed or kidney is distended due to any reason, it stretches the capsule and there are some pain receptors or stretch receptors are there. They stretch it and you feel pain. But where you will feel pain? At the back, back side and the lumbar region. This is one reason, stretching the capsule. Another reason? spasm of the smooth muscle a smooth muscle of the ureter actually right so smooth muscle in the organ whether in the kidney or in the ureter 
so you will feel pain again then pain can vary from a dull ache dull pain means not pinpointed to a severe pain to a pinpointed in the flank flank groin region that radiates downward to the lower abdomen so from the back side the pain goes to the anterior lower side right and when it goes lower side it goes to the groin region right so pain start from here but this pain if limited to the back side it is the kidney pain but if the pain emerging from the ureter smooth muscles of the ureter then it will radiate to the lower anterior side and going to the groin region anteriorly then pain is usually referred along the distribution of the subcostal t12 nerve t12 you have got the vertebra t12 t12 is here so there is a dermatomal level and that runs from posterior to the anterior so along that dermatomal level this pain radiates now we will start the ureter it is 25 cm long and carry the urine and then this is the point to understand this ureter descends behind the peritoneum it is a retroperitoneum like kidney ureter is also retroperitoneum and it crosses the pelvic brim what is pelvic brim this is the hip bone and the hip bone you can see uh, these are there is a line imaginary line this line is in the middle of the hip bone that divide the hip bone into a false upper and true lower pelvis so true pelvis false pelvis so true pelvis is below this line this line is imaginary line that is drawn between the promontory and the ala of the uh, sacrum and then this arcuate line pectinate pubis and pubic crest so this on both the side when you join this area this form the pelvic brim so when this ureter passes through and crosses the pelvic brim where the common iliac artery is also crossing so at this there is a kinking there is a bending here so this is another uh, site of constriction now pelvic brim is this portion right so this ureter passes through the pelvic brim and at the pelvic brim it 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 it, it meet with the common iliac artery then they enter obliquely on the posterior lateral corner of the bladder so in the bladder this ureter enter into the bladder from which side posterior lateral corner of the bladder so this is the posterior side of the bladder and this is the lateral side so this is the ureter that is going to penetrate into the wall so this is the penetrance of the wall this penetrance of the wall is enlarged here you can see this is the ureter and this is the wall of the urinary bladder right but this ureter is not opening perpendicular 90 degree right but it is making an oblique right see so this obliquity is very important so this oblique entry acts as a valve and helps prevent backward flow of the urine so when the bladder is full and the wall is stretched so when the wall is stretched that stretched wall also compresses this oblique duct so this oblique duct is due to stretching of the fullness of the bladder and during contraction so in stretching and in the contraction particularly in the contraction it contracts the muscle of the bladder and and this part that is obliquely running within the uh, bladder that is called the intramural part that is compressed by the contracting muscles so before urination when the bladder contract no urine can go back to the ureter it will go only forward into the urethra then in the ureter we have got three constrictions first constriction is at the origin of the bladder or origin of the ureter so this is the minor calyx major calyx major minor calyx is 1 2 3 major calyx 1 2 and then renal pelvis and this pelvis then join with the ureter so this is called a pelvi ureteric junction ureter and the pelvis where they join actually this is the point where the pelvis is turning into the ureter so this is the first point uh, so this is the narrowest point here the stones they can uh, stuck up here right second point where the stones can stuck due to constriction is this where this ureter 
is passing through the pelvis. So where it kinks, it is crosses the pelvis, right? So at the pelvis, common iliac artery is there. So where uh, where the kinking pelvic brim is located, where the common iliac artery is running. So actually, common iliac artery is running along the pelvic brim, right? So while crossing the pelvic brim, this common iliac artery also comes. Then the third point of constriction is where it pierces the bladder. So this oblique, this oblique thing, this is the most constricted part. Why we are discussing these three points? Because these three points are the most constricted point of the ureter. And this is the reason why the stones that form in the kidney, there are three these possible sites where the stone can plug, can stuck. So it's stuck at here, pelvic ureteric junction, or while crossing the pelvic brain or while penetrating the wall of the bladder. Now this slide, urinary bladder. Now in this slide, urinary bladder is a distensible muscular sac that is stored and expel the urine lies on the pelvic floor posterior to the pubic symphysis. Where is pubic symphysis? There is a pubic symphysis here. Posterior to the pubic symphysis is this urinary bladder. There is a uterus in the female. And there is a urinary bladder. Uh, uh, in males, anterior to rectum. In males, since uterus is not here, so this urinary bladder is anterior to this structure. This is the rectum of the large intestine, right? So rectum, anal canal. So since it is not present with the vagina and your uterus, so in males, urinary bladder is anterior to the rectum, while in females, urinary bladder is anterior to the uterus and the urethra is anterior to the vagina. And the females anterior to the vagina and uterus, it has an apex, base, superior surface and two inferior lateral surface. This is the empty urinary bladder. This is the empty urinary bladder and this is the lateral view, lateral cut section, this is the full so this is a triangular structure. This is the base at the posterior side. This is the anterior that is called apex, pointed part. So pointed part is this apex, right? Where the ligament is going up. This is a urecus. So urecus is the ligament that is shown here in the white color. So it is attached to the apex of the bladder. So which ligament is attached to the apex of the bladder? Urecus. Okay, this has got embryological uh, importance. Okay. Now, this which surface is superior surface, and there are two inferior lateral surface, right inferior lateral surface, and on the other side, left inferior lateral surface. So, we have got the apex directed towards the top of the pubic symphysis. So, this is the pubic symphysis, pubic symphysis. So, this is the apex facing toward the upper part of the pubic symphysis. Base is shaped like an inverted triangle and faces postero inferiorly. This is the base. Postero inferiorly, this is the base of the urinary bladder. Two ureters enter the bladder at each of the upper corner of the base. This is the base on each side, upper corner. Right upper corner and left upper corner ureter enters. And the urethra drains from the lower corner of the base. So this is the base upper part. This is the base upper side. The ureter will open here but from the base lower side, urethra will come out. So this is the base from the here, the base urethra is coming. This is the prostate that is the male side, right? So it is not present in the female. Just like here, you cannot see below the uh, urinary bladder, you will not find the prostate gland. But here, this is the picture of the male bladder. So here, prostate gland is visible. And this urethra is penetrating the prostate gland in the center. Now, this is the ureter, arterial supply of the ureter. This is important. This arterial supply of the ureter, arteries. Ureter is a very long structure, right? So, uh, there's no one single artery that supplies all along the ureter. So, it is divided into three parts, upper, middle, and lower. Upper part of the ureter is supplied from the renal artery, a branch of the renal artery. The middle part is supplied by the gonadal artery. Gonads means testis or ovary. If it is male, this testicular artery supplies the middle area 
and the female ovarian artery will supply the middle area. The lower one third of the ureter is usually supplied by the superior vesical artery, that is a branch of the internal iliac artery. So these are the renal artery, then testicular or ovarian artery, and superior vesical artery, and the veins corresponding to these. Then we have got the bladder, its blood supply. So bladder is here and its blood supply artery to the bladder, superior and inferior vesical artery. There is a superior vesical artery, which is a branch of the internal iliac artery. And inferior vesical artery, again, is one of the branches of the internal iliac artery. Internal iliac artery, there are 10 to, uh, 8 to 10 branches. So superior vesical and inferior vesical, they supply the blood supply to the bladder. And corresponding to this, there are veins that drain into the vesical venous plexus at the posterior surface of the blood. Now this is the urethra and urethra we have got a 20 centimeter long urethra in the males and extends from the neck of the bladder to the external urethra. Now this is the urethra, uh, urinary bladder and this is the neck of the uh, urinary bladder from here downward in the males this is the penis, right? This is the prostate gland and this is the muscular diaphragm. So these are the three parts of the urethra running in three different structures. So from here, from the neck, it arises from the neck of the urinary bladder, right? So from where the urethra arises, from which part of the urinary bladder? From the neck of the urinary bladder to the external meatus. This is the external urethral orifice or external urethral or uh, meatus or orifice now this male urethra is a very long one is 20 centimeter and it passes through different parts so that's why it is divided into three parts so first part of the urethra from the neck neck is here where the pointer is laid is, is located from here the urethra tube comes out and it penetrates this gland this gland is the prostate gland in the center of this gland prostate uh, urethra is passing and this part of the urethra is called prostatic urethra right it is about three centimeter long passes through a prostate gland it is the widest and most dilatable portion of the urethra this is important then the second part is the membranous urethra that is very small one centimeter 1.25 centimeter long and it lies with, within the urogenital diaphragm it is the least dilatable portion most dilatable least dilatable three centimeter one centimeter almost right it passes through the diaphragm where is the diaphragm this muscular this muscle is called as the urogenital diaphragm right it is form of levator and eye muscles right and this urethra very small one centimeter that is passing that is just penetrating piercing this muscle layer that only part is called as the membranous urethra then it comes into the very long penile urethra that is 15 centimeter, almost 16 centimeter long, uh, traveling through the bulb of the corpus spongiosum of the penis. Now, from here, from this levator urogenital diaphragm, from here onward, this very long urethra, this is called running in this structure, that is the penis in the males, and this is called the penile urethra, right? So this is the penile urethra. 15.75 uh, centimeter long and it passes the corpus spongiosum. Here in the males, there are three sets of bodies. Corpus means body, spongiosum, spongy, corpus <coughs> cavernosum that co contains the blood inside. So this one that urethra is passing into which corpus spongiosum, right? It, that is spongy urethra. So it's penile urethra, or spongy urethra is the same thing. Spongy urethra, penile urethra, same thing, right? Now, spongy in the sense, this is structure that is the urethra is passing through the cavernous, cavernosum, that is corpus spongiosum. So this spongiosum, which form the glands of the penis, so this part, the urethra is passing through which structure? Corpus spongiosum, right? So that is that corpus in spongiosum, the penile urethra is. Then we have got male urethra, 
vulvo urethral gland the male urethra here you can see this the bladder the neck of the bladder and from the neck the urethra passes through this gland prostate gland in the means then passes through this muscle layer urogenital diaphragm and then after passing this is the penile urethra very long right this is the bulbar part this is the penile part now bulbo urethral gland this is the gland that is inside this muscle this muscle urogenital diaphragm can you see this muscle this inside this muscle it is buried buried means it is hidden it is grounded inside the muscle so this is rounded structure this is the gland called as the bulbo urethral gland and there is gland this is exocrine gland so it has got a duct and this duct opens into this part of the the first part of the penile urethra this is the penile urethra so it it opens into the bulbous part of the penile urethra so opens into the penile urethra below the urogenital diaphragm this is the diaphragm muscular part then external ure urethral meatus external urethral meatus is the narrowest part of the entire urethra external urethral orifice external urethral or meatus is the same thing this tip this opening at the tip of the penis this is called the external urethral orifice this is the narrowest part right but before that there is a dilation that is called navicular fossa this fossa is a depression or cavity so external urethral meatus is the narrowest part of the entire urethra then this navicular fossa navicular fossa just before this external urethral meatus we have got a cavity a dilated part of the urethra so just at the end of the urethra it is dilated called as a navicular fossa is the part of the urethra that lies within the glans penis glans penis is this structure this head of the penis head of the penis this is the head of the penis this is called a glans penis and this head of the penis is formed by this blue structure can you see this blue structure this blue structure all this all blue structure this is the corpus spongiosum and in this blue structure this penile urethra this yellow color is running in the center of this corpus spongiosum and then dilated navicular urethra and then external urethral orifice in the male the urethra provides a common passage for urine and semen now come to the female in the female side what is the length of the female urethra since female don't have the penis so there is no penile urethra but apart from this the membranous urethra is there because urogenital diaphragm can you see this muscle horizontal this is the muscle urogenital diaphragm right so membranous urethra is also there but above that the prostatic urethra since in the female there is no prostate gland so there is no prostatic urethra so there is one single urethra that is coming that is only 4 cm long this ex extends from the neck of the bladder bladder the lowest part of the bladder where is the neck of the bladder this is the neck of the bladder right so bladder neck neck of the bladder is this point so this point is called the neck of the bladder so from here onward single urethra arises going down so in the female this is 4 cm long almost right and this is called the female urethra and exits the body between the clitoris and the vagina so this duct where it is opening if you see here this is the urinary bladder so urinary uh, urethra this is the female urethra it is passing coming out between this structure this small muscular structure behaves like a penis in the males right so this is called the clitoris so this is the remnant of the penis in the female clitoris but this is again a female structure so between this clitoris and posterior to this urethra is the vagina that goes to the uterus so uterus connects with the vagina so between vagina and clitoris the opening is the urethra right then at the side of the urethra urethral sphincter at the side of the external urethral sphincter are the small openings of the ducts of the para urethral gland so para urethral gland is this so can you see very small glands para means beside so urethra is here 
beside the urethra there are small glands right exocrine glands and their ducts opens uh, in the urethra okay thank you very much good